As you may have heard by now, the city with the most segregated school system in the country is not somewhere in the Deep South or a red state in the Midwest. No, it's us, New York City. And just last week, the Department of Education decided to take some small steps to alleviate the problem, like using variables other than race, like income and language. Here to help us understand how our schools have remained so segregated and what these latest steps could mean for our kids are two reporters who've covered the issue. Nicole Hannah-Jones, whose recent New York Times Magazine article, Choosing a School for My Daughter, made the story intensely personal. Thanks for being here, Nicole. And Patrick Wall, senior reporter for Chalkbeat, which covers education online. Great to have you. Thanks. And we want to welcome back another Nicole, this time with the C, Nicole Mader, data analyst for Inside Schools NYC and the Center for New York City Affairs. Hello. Hi. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we want to get deep into this issue. Let's start with the articles that were written. Nicole, your article in the New York Times, what can you tell us about how that detailed your experience in bed I believe, getting your child into a school? Right. So the story looks at um, what is the third most segregated large uh, school system in the country and how that makes uh, choosing integrated schools very challenging because we have such disparity between schools that largely serve black and Latino populations and then the small number of schools that white parents tend to send their children to. And so um, I've been covering school segregation for a long time, but then had my own child who was four years old and I was having to suddenly pick a school for her in this very segregated system. So what the piece does is kind of um, shows how my husband and I navigated that and ultimately made the decision to enroll our daughter in one of those segregated schools. Now, I, I completely understand this issue. My son is in Brooklyn as well, and seeing the segregation is, is bothersome with us as parents wanting to expose our children to different things. But New York City says that they're working to fix the issue. How are they fixing this? Well, there are a lot of small steps that the Farina administration has said that they might take. Um, there are a few schools that have said that they're going to set aside seats for children of diverse backgrounds based on languages or um, socioeconomic status. But there are only um, a few small plans, and there aren't any system-wide efforts. There are some potential plans in districts 1 and 13, so 13 being in Brooklyn, that might use controlled choice to help distribute the kids in all of the schools more evenly, but they are, um, have, they haven't had any plans, any commitments to implement this plan yet. So maybe we'll get into more possible solutions. Uh, Patrick, you wrote an article for Chalkbeat. What was your experience with your child and the segregated school system? Well, I don't have a child in the system, <laughs> but in District Sorry. 15, no, it's fine. Not yet. <laughs> Future yeah. child. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> But I was looking at District 15, which is Park Slope. Um, it goes south to Sunset Park and look at the middle schools there because those middle schools are pretty sharply separated. There's um, a group of the highest performing middle schools that some people refer to as the big three. And those are um, about 50% white and only 30% low income. And then the other uh, middle schools in that same district with the same you know, population, those are about 10% white and 80% low income. So there's this sharp divide among schools. And usually we talk about segregation as resulting from housing segregation. So people live in separate neighborhoods and so that is, so our schools reflect that. But in this district, you can actually choose to, to go to any, any middle school you want, regardless of your address, and yet there's still that segregation there. And so I think it just shows that this is more complicated than housing. It's also a factor of choices that families make, that schools make, because in this district, they get to screen or handpick their students. Mm -hmm. And also the city, the policies, because one thing the city lets happen is the high-performing students go into this top-performing set of schools, and the higher-need students end up in the other schools. So who's to blame for this? Is it the system or is it the parents not fighting back? I mean, I think if you want to cast blame, cast the net very wide. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we know that um, the segregation we see is the product of a long legacy of discrimination and segregation in the city, both in housing and in schools. I think it is, um, it is resulting from very poor leadership around the issue, where you haven't had anyone, whether they're Democrat or Republican, arguing for integration for a long time. But I also think, as my article points out, that it also is on the backs of individual choices of parents who say they want integration but aren't willing to give up anything to get that and, and tend to cluster, if you have means um, and privilege, to cluster your children in the best performing, heavily white schools. So I think the blame is, is very widespread. 
What about the issue of liberal hypocrisy here? I mean, that's there, my favorite issue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, what can you comment on the liberal hypocrisy here? I mean, also, you know, the parents with the more more affluence seem to have more influence. Uh, is there something to that, Nicole? Of course. I mean, that's the American way, right? We live in a capitalist society, and and the more money you have, the more access to power you have, the more people care about your concerns. But I think what um, I mean, even your opening about the most segregated schools are not in the South. Well, the most segregated schools have not been in the South for 50 years. Yeah. Um, the South has been the most integrated part of the country since the 1960s, late 60s. And so we have to think about how we keep framing this perennial issue as somehow surprising that white uh, liberal. Northerners somehow, you know, are are segregating. Well, they, they've they've been segregated for a very long time. Um, the issue is, and there's this old there's this old saying that in the South they wanted you close, but you better not go too high. In the North you could go as high as you want, but they didn't want you too close. So in the North segregation tends to happen where people weren't necessarily denying black people rights in the North. They just were secluding black people in ghettoized communities and ghettoized schools. And we've never undone that legacy. And we haven't had a desire to undo that legacy. You know, 50 years ago, segregation was seen as another form of racism. People talked about it, people used the word. Now, of course, we're sweeping the word under the carpet. And we can say that schools in New York are segregated, but why is it not acknowledged that that's racism? Let's just talk about it. I think a lot of people blame the school segregation on residential segregation without realizing that residential segregation is also a construct and it's a, a, a product of racism just as much as school segregation is. I think that we, um, Patrick already mentioned that there's uh, an element of choice in District 15 middle school applications. There's elements of choice throughout the whole New York City system, even at the elementary school level. So even if you are zoned to one elementary school, there are uh, parents who can navigate the choice system, get their kids into a gifted and talented program, other citywide schools, or they can choose charter schools. And the reasons why they are choosing, I think, need to be investigated more and need to be talked about, frankly, um, to see if there are um, conversations that we're not having about race in this process. And I would add to that that parents are pretty savvy these days about how they talk about these things. I've reported on the Upper West Side that there is a there are some proposals to rezone some schools and some affluent parents that that would affect their school have sent around privately among parents talking points to use and what to say and what not to say in order not to kind of inflame people's anger but in order to make their case so rather than saying you know we don't want to be with these certain types of students or things like that they talk about making an investment in their neighborhood school and about their property values so I think there's just there's a reluctance to talk about those things even though we know that race and class factor into these decisions. So often there's actions to put black and Hispanic children into schools with white children. How does that hinder the idea of comprehensive integration? Does anyone want to comment on that? Patrick? Say, can you frame it again for me? I mean, I, I don't know what steps that we're taking to have comprehensive integration if we kind of concentrate on putting black and Latino kids in with white kids and not mm. the other way around. So kind of ha having the, the black and Hispanic students kind of bear the burden of having to, to go to these other schools? Yeah, I guess. Uh, Nicole, can you comment on the data? I mean, what does the data show us in terms of maybe steps we can take to start to fix the problem? The data shows us that the, the, the schools that are in integrated neighborhoods, gentrifying neighborhoods, are more segregated than the neighborhoods themselves. So there are families that are living in those neighborhoods that could be going to those schools and aren't. So I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer your question um, with the data, yeah. but the um, I think that there are a lot of steps to um, improve the schools that, that are already in those neighborhoods and, and ensure that the parents there aren't trying to opt out and go to other schools and trying to find solutions that are leaving other families behind in schools that are not going to help them. Well, and the reality is parents want their children to go to the best schools. And for years, we know that schools in the hood are underfunded. They don't have books or supplies. Teachers are buying the supplies. I, I know these things as a fact. So we know that these changes are going to take some time to happen. It takes years to change laws. So I, I'll ask you, Nicole, as a, as a parent, what should parents do um, proactively to expose their children to different cultures and diversity while we work for this longer fight of segregating schools? So here's the thing, and this is this is why I say, you know, the answers have to be both systemic and individual, because 
you cannot expect parents to put their children in schools if they have choice. I mean, there's a lot of kids in schools that are not good schools, but those are parents who don't have a lot of choice. You can't expect parents with choice, because no one would choose to put their kids in a school that is under-resourced with inexperienced teachers, high turnover principals. Um, but the problem is, and this is why I do what I do, is there are kids in those schools right now. So while we're trying to figure out what's the best way to reform the system, we are putting kids through schools that are not educating them. And so to wait for some groundswell of uh, affluent white parents to push for equality is never going to happen. It's going to have to happen from the top, and someone at the top is going to have to decide this is the best thing for children. I think we often look at the, the demographics of the New York City public schools and say we can't really integrate because the white population is too small. But if you look at the white and Asian population, it's about 30 percent. If that was spread across the district, we would actually have very integrated, multiracial schools. The problem is Asian and, and white students are concentrated in schools together, and black and Latino students are concentrated together. And black students, even though they are a smaller um, racial group than Latinos, are the most segregated at, of all. So that tells you that it's more than just a numbers problem. It really is about parents avoiding certain students, and students they're largely avoiding are black students. So how well, do you change that? Right. Yeah, and speaking of people at the top, you know, Counselor, excuse me, Chancellor Farina said, if you look at the history of integration, the more that you mandate, the less likely it's going to take. Uh, would you care to comment on that, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I think this administration, uh, Chancellor Carmen Farina, but also Mayor Bill de Blasio, I think have been pretty ambivalent about um, school integration. I think that um, they made comments, the mayor has said that parents invest in where they want to live and, and make sacrifices to live there, and so the city doesn't necessarily want to disrupt that. And then, as you mentioned, the chancellor has talked about not forcing mandates on people. And so I think it's actually a sign, the fact that they were doing um, some of the small steps that Nicole mentioned is a sign of really the effectiveness of the grassroots push on them to really put this on their agenda, because when Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio was campaigning for mayor, Integration was not on his education agenda. It's, it was pre-K. It's been helping struggling schools. This just wasn't on there. And now they are doing some small steps. So I really think that's an indication that there has been a push from, from the ground up to force them to do that. But I think they're still deciding at the top how far they want to go and what that will mean for them politically. Because as we've seen in certain areas where this has been pushed in parts of Brooklyn and Upper West Side, there is a backlash from, from parents who feel like they would lose out if there is a stronger push for integration. So, if I could just add yeah. to that, though, um, one only has to look at the South, where the South has been the most integrated part of the country because it was forced to. It was mandated by the courts. It was mandated through laws. So I think that that idea that you can't force it is actually not true. Mm -hmm. um, now, these days, we're not—we're very unlikely to get a court order to integrate, and I think the South is, is different for many reasons. One, a lot of people here would just enroll in private schools, or they'll move to Westchester County to avoid integration. But if you have no leadership whatsoever—I mean, you have a huge bully pulpit as the mayor of the most liberal city, one of the most liberal cities in the world, um, that's not being used at all. Instead of saying we need to protect the property values of affluent people, maybe use that pulp, you know, that bully pulpit to talk about all of the children in the schools who deserve an equal education and asking people to live their values, and we just haven't seen that. And, and I, I want to hear more solutions. I mean, we, we tend to talk about the problem, what the issue is, and we, we know what the problem is. Where do we go from here today, tomorrow? I think until we do have more systemic solutions that are, that are led by the city, I think we're going to have to focus on improving individual schools and trying to ensure that the parents aren't avoiding those, the schools that they're zoned for. Um, I think that dual language programs, as Chancellor Farina just mentioned, that could be a helpful step to draw different types of parents to some of the schools that are lower enrolled. Um, there's also ways to incorporate gifted and language, gifted and talented programs in schools that are not segregated classrooms within a school, which is its own problem. And um, there are ways to implement those at schools that can bring, lift up the resources of the entire school and make a student body more diverse. Um, but all of these things would just kind of be integration whack-a-mole. If we keep doing this at one school, it's going to affect how the other schools around it um, are enrolling the students. So I think that we have to think more systemically in the long term. And just to add to that, there, as Nicole mentioned earlier, there are some plans for district-wide, individual districts within New York City, um, to change the enrollment system so that rather than parents just choosing where to go, there would be some sorting of students so that it's more evenly distributed, low-income and high-income students. 
Um, there's some very far along in the process plans in place, but so far the, the uh, Department of Education hasn't signed off on those. So I think that's one step that could go larger than these school by school efforts that we're kind of waiting to see whether the city will get behind them. I think we should be clear. There, there are no easy fixes to this. This is a problem that is decades, if not centuries, in the making. Um, there isn't a lot of will to do it. It does have to be systemic. You cannot fix this on a school-by-school -school basis. And even the programs that um, the chancellor holds up as possibly helping integration, like dual language and talented and gifted, tend to segregate still. Um, dual language programs tend to be heavily segregated, and black students don't get a lot of access to those. Talented and gifted, as we know, typically is used to segregate white children within black schools. So even the expansion of talented and gifted into black neighborhoods like Bedside that didn't have it before is also coming at the same time those neighborhoods are gentrifying, so it's very suspicious. Um, so I think we that you're just not going to find these small fixes. It's just going to patch over and maybe help a small number of kids. Meanwhile, we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of kids who are, who are going to get nothing. And Nicole, for those who didn't read your New York Times article, what ended up happening with your daughter? What's her situation today? I mean, she's still at uh, the segregated school that we chose, and she's thriving and doing well. And um, we're just looking to see whether the white parents who have been rezoned to our school are going to come or not. Wow, it's a big deal. You, you, you know, and, and just one last thing, I, I think something that we also need to talk about is the parents' responsibility. I mean, you took power into your own hands, and you wrote about this. That's a form of just speaking up and protesting. And I, and I think that politicians, they care about votes. So I think then when we as a people, when we get together and we talk about these things loudly, unified, then it makes the politicians, the local politicians that have the power with this, and largely federally, speak up. And they hear the cry, and they work to make a difference. But if we're not saying anything outside of these circles, then th they won't hear us. Absolutely. I mean, what Patrick said is true. Where we're seeing integration efforts, it's because parents have been demanding it. And when we're not seeing it, it's because those parents haven't been demanding it. That's so right. if we truly want to live up to our values, then the system will respond. That's but right. I think the system is responding to, to what parents are asking. And they're mm -hmm. certainly mostly not asking for integration. Right. Yeah, well, hopefully the system responds because I think, you know, it's, it's about time such a diverse city isn't the most segregated city in the country. Thank you very much for the work that you guys do, and thank you very much for being here on BK Live. Great job.